Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to you, Mr. Cousins. Thank you. And you too. Um, Soon for those of you who don't know me, my name is um, David Carr, and I'm the legal director of the Libertarian Alliance. Um, and uh, this morning session, uh, and being 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, is the Libertarian Alliance conference equivalent of the graveyard shift. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to see, in fact, that the turnout is, is so good. I put this down to the nature of the subject, uh, which, uh, which is going to involve sex. And for some reason, I have no idea why, uh, but any sessions which tend to involve matters uh, concerning sex tend to be moderated by me. Uh, I've no <laughs> idea what this is. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the Politburo of the Libertarian Alliance seem to think I have a tremendously libertine existence. I, I, I hope not, because it's just not true. Um, the, um, this morning's um, session, uh, I think, uh, will be very interesting on a couple of levels. First of all, because of the obvious reason. But secondly, um, because um, it seems to be um, an unfortunate feature of modern life that when there is a high profile tragedy, such as a murder or a terrorist attack or some sort of disaster, a plane crash, a shipwreck, whatever, the way we process this, the, the therapy that seems to be open to the uh, families of the victim is to seek a whole bevy of bad and despotic laws in the wake of it. Mm. Now, I, I don't know if this is one of the features possibly of the decline of religion in society, which mostly I'm rather pleased about, but may have this effect of people still needing that kind of, of therapy and finding other secular ways to do it. The reasons may be very complicated. However, um, a, a few years ago in this country there was uh, a, a high profile and terrible murder. Um, a, and um, indeed the victim's family then took it upon themselves to campaign uh, assiduously for a new set of laws um, prohibiting the images that people are allowed to possess on their computers, as if this would somehow bring the victim back. Um, there is now a campaign to oppose this and to overturn it, and that campaign is called Backlash. And our speaker this morning is Mr. Miles Jackman, who is the legal advisor or legal consultant to Backlash. And he's going to be telling us about what his organization is doing to oppose these despotic laws and get them overturned. Um, before, we, before I do finally introduce Miles, I'd just like to say that uh, because of the nature of what he's discussing, I do have to give a warning um, that he is going to be discussing matters of uh, quite an extreme sexual nature, of necessity. I say that because, of course, we do have some younger members with us, and in Libertarian Alliance terms, that means under 50. Um, and and, and uh, you might be uh, somewhat uh, embarrassed by this. However, I hope you're not. Uh, or if you are, that you're not sufficiently embarrassed that you want to leave, because I'm sure Miles is going to be fascinating, and this is an important subject which you may or may not think affects you, but does affect us as a free society. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Jackman of Backlash. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Do I need the amplification or am I... Yeah, good, thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm afraid that while I will be talking about extreme sexuality, um, it will be a very staid discussion on the legal perspective. So I'm afraid it, it may not be quite as exciting as I've been uh, billed, but we'll see. Um, I'm afraid I was hoping to project this on, on the side there via PowerPoint. We've had a few technical issues. 
so um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to read out rather large chunks of law. I apologise for that. If I'm going too fast through them, um, if you can't hear, please just say. So this session is entitled Sex and Censorship, and um, I've subtitled it Extreme Pornography because we're dealing here with the Section 63 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008. And to give you the exact details of that, it defines extreme pornography as of such a nature that it must reasonably be assumed to have been produced solely or principally for the purposes of sexual arousal, which is grossly offensive, disgusting, or otherwise of an obscene character, and portrays any of the following. One, an act which threatens a person's life. Two, an act which results or is likely to result in serious injury to a person's anus, breasts, or genitals. And then uh, three and four are acts involving sexual interference with a human corpse and the intercourse with the sex with an animal. Now, just to reassure you, Backlash is only interested in the first two of those regarding adult sexuality and consensual sexual behaviour. However, I do have to talk about these matters since they are involved in the legislation. But as a matter of course, Backlash cannot condone any activity with cadavers or animals since they are incapable of consent at law. Uh, the final qualification of this is that a reasonable person looking at the image would think that any such person or animal was real. Now, just to break that down, that covers staged acts. And it's, uh, so any activity which is acted or enacted, uh, and this is irrespective of whether the participants consent. Uh, so obviously people could be consenting to this sexual activity, it could be legal to do, but the representation thereof could be classified as extreme pornography. Classified works are exempt, which means in terms of films, BBFC certified films rated all of the way up to BBFC uh, Restricted 18, which is the extreme hardcore pornography, or I should say hardcore pornography classification. Uh, but this is where it gets interesting. An extract from classified work, such as a BBFC rated film, can be extracted for the purposes of sexual arousal. Now, in the um, committee stage of this, there was much debate about the Bond film Casino Royale. Now, I don't know if you've seen it, I haven't actually seen the film, but I'm assuming a few of you would have seen it. And there's a sequence in it, I understand, where the sort of evil master villain, as is the way of Bond films, is flagellating Bond, who is somewhat, I believe, homoerotically posed in his boxer shorts or Y fronts or something like that, and he's being flagellated. Now, the question is, this is rated from a 12-rated film. According to this legislation, if that section in itself were excised from the film and then put next to other material of a similar nature, so otherwise whipping or flagellation type scenes, not only would the whipping flagellation seem to be extreme pornography, so would Bond. So we have a slightly perverse and bizarre system uh, coming out. Now, next section is the definition of what is actually pornographic. Now, whether an image is pornographic is not up to a magistrate or a jury to determine. And it's not a question of the intentions of those who actually produce the image itself. The question is one of context, as I just explained with the Bond movie. So, if an image is held to be part of a larger series of images, whether it is extreme pornography is determined by the context in which the image itself appears. So, we have a clear ambiguity here that the same image might be legal in one context, but not in another. The question next is what constitutes serious injury? And serious injury is not defined in the act itself. This is up to the magistrate or jury to decide subject to Ministry of, Guideline, uh, Ministry of Justice guidelines. The bill gives examples of acts which could be covered, and here's where I'm afraid I need to get explicit. Uh, so we have depictions of hanging, suffocation, or sexual assault involving a threat with a weapon, the insertion of sharp objects into, the, into or the mutilation of breasts and genitals. Now, if I can take one of those, which is sexual assault involving the threat of a weapon. If I were to, of a Sunday afternoon, in uh, sexual play, threaten my partner, knowing that this is a consensual activity and we're just having a bit of fun, and I threaten her with my grandmother's fish knife, which is blunt as anything, I could theoretically be indulging in activity which, if recorded, could constitute extreme pornography. So, the definition of extreme is different to that in the Extreme Obscene Publications Act, and as we'll see throughout the course of the session, 
This is really an attempt by government to open up the Extreme Publications Act to cover internet-based materials. Uh, of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, the Extreme Publications Act has that famous test in it where an image or text must deprave and corrupt those likely to view it. Uh, whereas in the case of the extreme pornography legislation, the dictionary definition of obscene is where grossly offensive and disgusting is given as an example of what could be obscene. There is, however, a defence which uh, Backlash were very successful in getting inserted into the legislation, and that is if the defendant can prove that he or she directly participated in the act, so, so I gave you the example of my partner and uh, my grandmother's fish knife, if, uh, if we are recorded doing that, we are exempt from the legislation, but only if the activity is consented to by those parties, and only if it's an activity which is capable of being consented to at law in the first place. The photographer who takes a picture, however, is not exempt. Uh, just to give you a clearer picture of what this means in practical terms, the sentencing tariff for the first two activities the maximum sentence is one of three years' custody. Adult sentence for at least two years on this will be placed on the Sex Offenders Register as a mandatory tariff. Okay, just to give you some background now as to how this arose, uh, there is uh, an operation colloquially known as Operation Spam, which some of you, if you're law students or lawyers, may recognise as the case of R. M. Brown. Uh, Spam was the operation carried out by Manchester Police in about 1987. It regarded um, consensual homosexual BDSM activity, that is what is now, I believe, called SM activity, so I'll be using the phrase BDSM right there, just, uh, just for clarity's purpose. Anyway, Manchester Police found, for various reasons, some videos which they believed were genuine snuff movies which involved people being tortured and then murdered. They had a massive operation which cost three or four million pounds investigating. They walked up to the defendant's doors, knocked on the doors, only to find them alive and well. The defendant said, yes, we consented. We were involved in private consensual homosexual BDSM activities. What of it? And the CPS charged 16 of these men with various offences, up to including actual bodily harm. This case went all of the way to the House of Lords, and it's often, again, as I say this, if any of you are law students or lawyers, you may agree, uh, is often taught in law schools as a perverse judgment as in it makes very little sense as to why consenting adults were not allowed to consent at law to certain activities. Now, um, I'm not going to propose this position, but there are those who say that it may have been a certain uh, anti-homosexual or homophobic bias on the part of the law lords. This judgment was 1992, if I remember rightly, so it's some time old, although it's still good law in itself. Um, the House of Lords dismissed the appeal with a 3 to 2 majority, so there was two people dissenting on the Lords against it, but Lord Templeman himself stated, I'm not prepared to invent a defence of consent for sadomasochistic encounters which breed and glorify cruelty. Cruelty is uncivilised. Uh, after that, the matter was appealed to the ECHR. Uh, the failed. appeal on the basis of the HR courts upheld the government's right to protect the general public good and the protection of morals. Now, the consequences of this mean that it became illegal for individuals, whether gay, straight, or whatever in between, uh, causing injuries that are more than transient and trifling. Further to that, anyone giving evidence that they consented could be charged as an accessory to their own assault. <laughs> Good. Um, a second consequence of this is why we're here today. In the Criminal Justice and Immigration Bill 2007, the government cited the Spanner case as justification for criminalising images of consensual acts depicted in such extreme pornography. The second piece of background I need to give you uh, was alluded to earlier and is, is somewhat more tragic and this is the death of Jane Longhurst at the hands of Brett Coots. Um, Mr Coots was convicted of murder on the 3rd of February 2004, however the original conviction was quashed by the Court of Appeal in 2006 on the basis that it was unsound. Now just to give you some background in case you're unaware of the uh, activities of Mr Coots and the tragic death of Ms Longhurst, 
situation was that apparently Mr. Coots had been obsessed with what is called in this material breath play, so asphyxiation or erotic asphyxiation, uh, and was absolutely obsessed with it. So it, it's it's said he met Ms. Longhurst and she died from his strangulation. Um, however. As I will go on to show, the original conviction for murder was held to be unsafe. However, there was a second trial somewhat later in 2007 and he was again convicted. I need to make that clear. But this is a comment on the judgment by Lord Hutton regarding the quashed appeal. And uh, this is a comment from a barrister sympathetic to the backlash cause. And he says as follows. Lord Hutton's judgment points out that Coots had engaged in breath play sexual games with previous partners years before he started to use internet porn. The judge commented that if the same defendant, guilty of the same conduct, had been tried before the same jury, but without the evidence that he used internet porn, the jury would have been very likely to accept that he did not intend to kill. Now this is the essential part. It's hard to escape the conclusion that the judge thought the evidence that Coots used porn prejudiced the jury and led to unfounded assumptions about Coots' intent. What this judgment shows is that the obsession with criminalising the users of porn will further prejudice juries and lead to miscarriages of justice. So those are the two things that the government would seem to have had in mind in around 2005 was the campaign by uh, a certain MP, who I won't dignify with a name, uh, with regard to Ms. Longhurst's tragic death and wanting to ban extreme pornography, and then the span of judgment about actual consenting acts rather than representations thereof. So in August 2005, the Home Office published a consultation document on extreme pornography. Then um, uh, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State Paul Goggin said, we are determined to act against publishers where we can believe that individuals also need to take greater responsibility. So we're proposing to strengthen the criminal law in respect of possession of a limited category of extreme material featuring adults. So there we see there's been a shift from the old Obscene Publications Act from the publishers of such material to the possessors, the end users who are viewing pornography in the privacy of their homes and wherever else. This raises the question of whether this is harm-based legislation. Now, in the consultation document, it was acknowledged by the government the absence of conclusive research results as to the possible negative effect of such material. So, in the first place, there was no evidential link that the government could form between extreme pornography or pornography of any stripe and any forms of actual sexual violence. They were incapable of citing any research to support their contention. Nonetheless, they stated at the time that the intended legislation was to cover realistic depictions of the activities listed, but not, for example, text or cartoons. And again, this is important. Uh, text or cartoons were considered to be really unrealistic um, and therefore were to be avoided by the act. By realistic depictions, we intend to capture those scenes which appear to be real and are con convincing, but which may be acted. So again, we've got this strange <laughs> situation. If I can allude to one of the sites which was discussed in committee, it's a site called Necrobabes. Now, I've never seen Necrobabes, so I can't tell you as to what the content is more than I've read in committee. But apparently, it features actors and actresses who pretend to be dead. Now, obviously, the important word there is pretend. They're not really dead. And as we've seen, these scenes, which may be acted, but are convincing. So, of course, it raises the question as to what level of conviction is required. Uh, the prescribed activities that were listed were the same as those I, I read earlier, and the ones that we're concerned with today are those of serious violence in a sexual context and serious sexual violence. Now, I'm afraid, a, a quick legal definition, I'm afraid. Uh, the categories we were concerned with, serious violence, would involve or would appear to involve serious bodily harm in a context or setting which is sexual, such as suffocation, hanging, sexual references. And therefore, they were talking about a level of harm around grievous bodily harm, which again, I'm sure most of you will know, is above 
uh, ABH, GBH being the more serious offence and, and the less serious offence other than murder and manslaughter. So technical definition <coughs> being, in layman's terms, a wound which breaks the skin and draws blood. Now, in the consultation document, there was an allusion to the human rights issues of freedom of expression and the right to private life, or Articles 8 and 10. Uh, and they state quite boldly that our view is that both our domestic courts and the Strasbourg Court will find our proposed uh, proposition compatible with Article 10 and Article 8, if that is raised, as if someone would do such a thing. So, as a consequence of this backlash was formed, uh, as a campaigning organisation to try and lobby the government into either completely avoiding the law or at least amending it so that there were some sensible defences such as the ones which I mentioned earlier, we uh, contacted uh, a very eminent QC, Rabinder Singh at Matrix Chambers, who's a leading civil liberties lawyer, uh, and commissioned an opinion from him. He critiqued the document and his suggestions were as follows. Firstly, that the potential penalty of three years imprisonment for looking at adult pornography in private is a very serious interference with an individual's right to respect for an intimate aspect of their private life under Articles 8 and 10. He also noted the fact that there's no proof that the use of such individuals causes or induces violence that the offence would also presumably catch those who cre create these images themselves in their own homes, which we've already discussed. Um, and this would be the case even where there was no risk to anyone of physical harm. Uh, he, from a practical perspective, also suggested that it's unlikely that an individual will find it difficult to assess the legislation whether she or he is committing a criminal act by viewing a particular material. Now, in practical terms, that means if you log on to the internet, go to a particular site, and you are bombarded with images, how are you as an individual to assess whether or not that particular image is one of extreme pornography, which is a very reasonable concern? So in conclusion, he stated that he had very real concerns about the individual's rights under Articles 8 and 10 of the Convention. Um, after this, because the consultation process was between a separate legal system in Scotland and England and Wales, the Scottish Law Commission asked, uh, should the offence of assault not be constituted by any activity which all of the parties have given their consent for the purposes of sexual gratification? In other words, they asked, should there be an absolute defence of consent to extreme sexual activities which are consented to by all parties. Now that, I believe, is part of the Scottish law. That defence exists in Scotland, as far as I'm aware, but not in the separate legal jurisdictions of England and Wales. So we are subject to an entirely different situation. Uh, in August 2006, the Home Office reported back after their consultation, confirming that they intended to push ahead with the new law. Uh, Backlash submitted uh, around, I believe, 300 responses from individuals uh, who, from a spectrum, were broadly opposed to the law. Uh, to be fair, just to put the other side of the story, there was about an equal side uh, on the other end of the spectrum against uh, the backlash position, in other words, in favour of the law, uh, ranging from anti-pornography feminist groups, Christian groups, and so on. But there was a reasonable balance, at least in numbers, between those who responded on either side. Uh, in June 2007, the Ministry of Justice issued some notes as to what would be defined as an extreme image. Uh, again, these are very similar to the things that we've been talking about before, so acts which threaten or appear to threaten, and it's that appear to threaten which is important, which could include depictions of pain, suffocation, and so on, uh, or the acts which result in or appear to result in serious injury to a person's body being anus, breast, or genitals. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in October 2007, the bill was at the second reading in the House of Commons stage, and Backlash issued a critique, 
uh, including in criticisms we've discussed before, such as the evidential link between pornography and violence. And further points that we suggested were that including people who look at or engage in non-abusive consenting activities of violence Putting them on the sex offenders register would dilute its effectiveness. So I'm sure we're all aware of what the sex offenders register is primarily and principally for. And the state and putting people involved in private consenting activities on that, it, we would suggest is an undue harshness and simply makes it less effective. Uh, such a broad proposal is likely to criminalise hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who uh, currently engage in such private consensual activities, including members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans community. Uh, we also noted again the shift of emphasis from the Obscene Publications Act from publishers to the consumers of pornography. Uh, and again, the absence of a depraved and corrupt test in the Obscene Publications Act, which would provide for a lower threshold to make it easier to convict individuals. Uh, and finally, as I say, said before, whether an act appears to be real to the viewer is an extremely subjective test. Uh, there was much criticism in the House, but uh, in November 2007, uh, MP Harry Cohen tabled amendments eliminating references to the controversial appears to section, and also introduced an exemption for staged acts undertaken by consenting actors. These were later withdrawn for various reasons that I won't go into. So, there was the possibility that acts enacted by consenting actors should be exempt in, in a similar way to the American system of pornography, which I believe involves uh, fairly rigorous tests of the individuals, consent forms and so on, so that everyone is aware that people who have engaged in these activities have done so under no duress. However, as I said, unfortunately these amendments were withdrawn. At the third reading in the House, uh, MP John McDonnell stated that on the third reading, only one backbencher has been allowed to speak for 90 seconds. Some have described this as a disgrace. Today we have sunk to a new level in the House in failing properly to scrutinise the bill. Dave Heath chimed in, stating, I think this has been a deplorable advertisement for the powers of this House to scrutinise legislation effectively. Uh, then in February 2008, the bill reached the Lords Committee and Baroness Miller stated, legislation needs to be objective and evidence-based, not subjective. And also, we need to concentrate on the fact that this sloppy clause is dangerous. Uh, furthermore, Lord Wallace of Tankness stated, having engaged in, in it consensually would not be a crime, but to have a photograph of it in one's possession would be a crime. That does not, to me, seem to make sense. Uh, equally critical were the Joint Committee on Human Rights, uh, stating individuals seeking to regulate their conduct in accordance with the criminal law cannot be certain that they will be committing a criminal offence by having certain images in their possession. Uh, this matter at this stage was supported, the backlash position, by Amnesty International, Liberty and Justice, so a few fly-by-night organisations in our back pocket. Um, nonetheless, on the 7th of May 2008, the bill was passed. Uh, as I've previously stated, Section 63 stated that an image is to be deemed obscene if it is of such a nature that it must be reasonably assumed to have been produced solely or principally for the purposes of sexual arousal. While to be extreme, it must be grossly offensive, disgusting, or otherwise of an obscene character, and follow in uh, portray one of the following, uh, as I said, the A and B act which threatens a person's life or results in serious bodily injury. And a reasonable person looking at the image must think that any such person was real. The act commenced in January 2006, becoming effective law in England and Wales, and as was necessary, the Crown Prosecution Service issued guidelines for their prosecutors uh, and they stated, although the Act does not state what a serious injury is, prosecutors must be aware that by the very nature of its name, serious injury will not include trivial or transient injuries, which include bruises and grazes. So in practical terms, that would be at a level of, uh, of common assault. 
So we're, we're back to the Spanner situation of any injuries that are consented to above the level of actual bodily harm are illegal, despite the consent element. The Association of Chief Police Officers stated this is not intended to infringe upon the personal lives of citizens or dictate their lawful sexual activities. This is about countering material that is sexually violent and illegal in nature and is not about affecting one's civil rights and liberties. On the other side, Andrew Murray of the LSE said, for the first time, it is now illegal to possess material which is produced consensually and without harm to anyone, and which is unlikely to cause harm in the future. It is not just the BDSM community that is affected by this, it is anyone who enjoys their freedom to speak and express themselves without fear of censorship. So that's the position with regard to the passage of the bill. Where are we going in the future, perhaps? Well, you may remember I mentioned text and cartoons being exempt. Anyone want to guess what's next on the agenda? Extreme writing legislation. Um, now, you may have heard about the Girls Allowed case. Uh, is anyone familiar with that? No, yes. Um, I've got one more from Nick who's in backlash, so I'd better address that. Um, there's a case, I believe it's Darren Walker was the gentleman's name. He wrote an article which involved the torture and rape of girls allowed. Now, it was a written article, purely fictitious text, which was then posted on the internet. Now, the Crown Prosecution Service stated that they were going to uh, pr proceed under the Obscene Publications Act, and the matter went all the way to trial, only to carve at the last minute, because the prosecution offered no evidence, and he was acquitted, on the basis, we assume, that they thought that the Obscene Publications Act was toothless and would be ineffective. Hence, we have the spectre of this Extreme Writing Act. Similarly, is the Extreme Cartoon Act, which is uh, bubbling under. Again, this is for comic books or pictures. So those, active, those which are images which are clearly unreal because they are drawn and they so in a reasonable, reasonable right thing real. real. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are very serious uh, works of literature which may be affected. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the gentleman Alan Moore, who wrote V for Vendetta and Watchmen, amongst other things. Well, he also wrote a book called Lost Girls, which is about, and it's a very literary work about um, pubescent sexuality in Victorian literature. Unfortunately, because it addresses this subject, it is very likely to be hit by the extreme writing and cartoon act. Uh, just to summarise on extreme writing, in July 2009 of this year, Baroness O'Kathan proposed this amendment for extreme pornographic writings, stating, and these words may sound rather chilling and familiar now, writing falls within this subsection if it portrays in an explicit or realistic way, so just to be clear there, that's writing that's explicit and realistic, any act which threatens a person's life, an act which results or is likely to result in serious injury to a person's anus, breasts, or genitals. In writing! Anyway, so we have a similarity there between writing and pornography. It seems to be a broader campaign by a puritanical government to, uh, to restrict the individual's freedoms with regard to pornography, sexual expression, and individual right to private life. Uh, at that moment in time, I'd like to open the floor up, subject to your... Well, yes, uh, there any questions? If, if you've wound up, I'll say, as is customary, I'm going to open the floor for, now for questions. Uh, because we have a limited amount of time, um, if you do want to make a speech as opposed to a question, please do so. But um, I'm going to have to ask you to be quick, and if it wasn't illegal, I would say I'll be strict with you about this. Uh, the first hand I saw go up was Ben Cousins. Sorry to be so greedy. Uh, a, a couple of points. Yes. Um, uh, crimes against the person yes. are always happening. It is very important that when they do, evidence is procured. Uh, uh, one of the ludicrous things about this sort of legislation uh, seems to be uh, uh, that procuring evidence in the case of genuine crimes against the person is seriously put at risk. 
uh, that in itself uh, seems to be terrible. Uh, the last point is it seems to be uh, that it would actually become a crime uh, uh, to describe outside the privilege of the courtroom uh, 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 dreadful acts uh, uh, of murder, whether by armed forces uh, uh, or elsewhere. Uh, this is a general point about, about legislation. Um, it seems to me that, in a sense, the worse and the more ludicrous the laws that are passed by the lynch mob which lives in the House of Commons, uh, the more chance we have of holding the government and the MPs up to deserved hatred, ridicule and contempt. Uh, and it seems to me uh, uh, that a general rollback uh, of the oppressive character of our legislation uh, could start uh, with a procedural attack of the lynch method so much legislation uh, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, given uh, until eventually we have no uh, legislative laws at all get back to Congress. Is that, is that yeah, OK, well, three, three quick points. Uh, the crimes and evidence situation, as I said, with regard to the Spanner case, obviously giving evidence that you consented to an act, you're giving evidence against yourself in that matter, which seems completely perverse to me use the word in the other sense of its meaning. Um, with regarding uh, recording activities or speaking about activities, we need to be clear here that they have to be sexual activities. So war crimes <coughs> that are non-sexual, for instance, I think that's what you're referring to, atrocities of war, yes. would have to be, under this legislation, would have to be sexual, unfortunately, and then recorded. But that could be in writing and caught by the Obscene Publications Act or broadcast on the internet in some form and then under the extreme pornography legislation. Uh, with regard to your final point regarding the rollback of, of legislation, I completely endorse your position. Um, we are looking, I assume, at the change of government very soon and whether that will be an opportunity for such rollback we can only speculate on. Uh, however, Backlash will be lobbying for that almost certainly, and we will also be fighting against the extreme writing and extreme cartoon laws which are bubbling under. We hope they'll be dropped. We, if they're not, we'll lobby against them. The second hand I uh, saw got was uh, Tony Brown, and the third hand was the gentleman in the blue T-shirt there, and then the lady in the green. So, Tony. Arguably, wouldn't the uh, act, as you described it, catch both the images from Abu Jared, if I've got the prison name right, uh, of American sexual torture of detainees. And what about um, uh, cosmetic and other surgery on Channel 4? Because that's using a scalpel to cut into people's breasts. Yeah. It takes place in a sexual context, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with regard to the average grade material. Um, if that were, of course, in this situation, would have to be in the context of uh, other material which was uh, also sexual. Uh, if it were purely out of grading material, then there would be an argument that it was exempt because it was news coverage or the equivalent, because the arts are covered. So, hence with your Bond movie, uh, if that's excised. Uh, secondly, I agree with regard to cosmetic surgery. Also, there are people who enjoy um, hanging what's called hook suspension. You see this at, at performance clubs like the Bizarre Ball and similar, which is uh, putting hooks into one's body and then suspending oneself from them, and that could be argued similarly to, to interfere with the body. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we've in fact only got time for one more. I'm so sorry. Uh, so the gentleman in the blue t-shirt, please, could you make it brief, sir, please? Will do. Uh, Christopher Beavis. Um, I think one of the most troubling uh, aspects of all of this is the way in which the state is systematically seeking to override individual consent in an increasing number of contexts. Uh, given the trend in this country on, uh, shall we say, the dilution of the historic stance on euthanasia, is there any possibility uh, that a person fairly soon may be able to consent to their own death, but may not in fact be able to consent to their own injury if it is done in a context which is seen as sexually gratifying? And, uh, what happens if, for example, a person consents to their own death in a euthanasia context Quickly. because they decide to do it in such a way that their partner finds sexually gratifying? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Miles has got any comeback on that point, Miles. As a criminal defence lawyer, 
I'm often advising my clients to say no comment. At this time, I have no further comments. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it remains for me to thank Miles Jackman for a fascinating and, and disturbing presentation, which I all hope you'll take on board. And thank you very much for listening. See you in the next session.